Praise the Lord. Church, if you are still there, I said, Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. A gracious God, we thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your only begotten Son into this world of sin to die for every one of us on the cross of Calvary. We ask you, oh Lord, that the benefit of the sacrifice of Christ will come to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. That every sin Calvary provided, everything Christ provided when he died on the cross of Calvary will be ours in Jesus' name. For spirit, for soul, for body, for family, for loved ones, for the whole church, and for those who are still coming, we pray, Lord, your blessings will flow into every life in Jesus' name. May everyone find you their sufficiency today. That every need of our lives, you'll take care of. And that, Lord, will be practical, personal possession of everything you have provided. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen before you sit down. Thank you. God bless you. Sit down the blessing of the Lord. We're coming tonight to something very significant, very important, very essential. For you to know, not only to know, but you to have, not only to have, for you to preserve something that God brings in your heart, in your life. And he does that through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And he's telling us tonight that whatever the need may be, and whatever the need has been, that there is sufficiency at Calvary. There is sufficiency on the cross. There's sufficiency in Christ. That everything you needed in the past, Everything you need as of now. Anything and everything you will ever need. The Calvary has paid the whole price and is available for you. And I pray that tonight the Lord will open your eyes of understanding. You behold, you'll see in Jesus' name. But looking at the word of God on his sacrifice, our sufficiency, his sacrifice, a sufficiency, whatever need you are thinking about in your life, spiritually, materially, and physically, whatever need you are thinking about, as you look at people around you, you look at this one with a peculiar need and that one peculiar need, whatever need it may be, Calvary has paid the whole price. And praise the Lord, he pays the price for you. I said he pays the price for you. A sacrifice, our sufficiency. Look at First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And we look at his sacrifice, what is done for us. It says, Push out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. Look at this. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Even Christ, the Son of God, even Christ, the Redeemer, even Christ, the Provider of all blessings. He died for us on the cross of Calvary and he says, it's a Passover. And you remember the Passover, if you have been a reader of the Bible, the student of the Bible, when the children of Israel were in Egypt. And then they were to cross over to the new land and to the new place. And death was going to ravage every house in the land of Egypt, in the country of Egypt. And then the Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And Jesus Christ has been sacrificed as the Lamb of God that taketh away all the sins of the world and takes away all the consequences of sin we have ever committed. He came to reverse everything that Adam had done. And he says here now, Christ, a Passover, Christ, the Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. And that sacrifice is sufficient. That sacrifice is full. That sacrifice 
whole sway in heaven and on earth in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 2. It says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself, look at this, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. It tells us here that Christ has offered himself, has given himself, he surrendered himself to the death of the cross of Calvary. He's giving an offering, he's giving as a sacrifice, and that is a sacrifice that takes away the pollution of sin, the penalty of sin, and the evil of sin that sin brought, that Adam and Eve brought into this world. And he says now, it's because of his love. He has loved us. And he has given himself. It's not that he's going to do it. He's done it already. The price for your salvation paid already. The price for your healing paid already. And the price for sanctification, holiness paid already. And the price for every need of your life paid already. He has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. For a sweet smelling savor. And I pray that tonight, and not only tonight, every day of your life, that sacrifice of Christ will be effectually effective in every life in Jesus' name. I thought somebody there will say, Amen. Amen. And in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, talking about the sacrifice of Jesus, and that's what sacrifice has accomplished. And what it will do in your life, what it will do in your family, what it will do in every believer, what it will do in everyone that comes to the Lord. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy place, made into the holy places, made with hands, which are the figures of the true. It says, But into heaven itself. That is, when he made that sacrifice, and that acceptable sacrifice, he went with his blood to heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us as our advocate. For us as our sacrifice. For us as our substitute. For us as the one that paid the price of our sin and the penalty. He went to God. He went to heaven with that blood of sacrifice. And now he appears in the presence of God for us. Not yet. That he should offer himself often. As the high priest enter, enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others, other animals. For then must he often have offered, has suffered since the foundation of the world. Look at this. But now, but now, but now, once in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That passage again mentions sacrifice. That's what Christ has done. Thank God he did it for you. Thank God he did it for me. And he did it for everyone. And I pray that that sacrifice will avail in every life, even here tonight in Jesus' name. And as you call upon the Lord, and you're not making another sacrifice, you're not going for an animal, you're not going for any other sin, you're not coming in any other name. You come in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who paid the price for you. And you know, he is our sacrifice and he is our sufficiency and it's sufficient for every, for, for every need in your life. We come to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm reading here from verse 12. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Here is it. It says, for this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, he has offered one sacrifice, final sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice, complete sacrifice, a God-pleasing sacrifice for sins, for our sins, 
for your sins. And it says, forever. Never to be done over again. Never to be repeated. He sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expect him till his enemies be made his footstool. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, for by one sacrifice, for by that final stroke that struck him on the cross of Calvary, for by one sacrifice he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And as we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus tonight, you must understand quite a lot of things go along with that sacrifice. One, there was suffering in that sacrifice. Another thing, there was tribes laid on him before that sacrifice. And as you think about everything, the stripe and the suffering and the sacrifice and the offering and the oblation, everything, everything came to provide for all you will ever need. And all you need tonight, and as apply and appeal to the Lord on the basis of that sacrifice, thank God you'll find him sufficient today. I said you'll find him sufficient today. His sacrifice, our sufficiency, Christ's sacrifice, the sufficiency for every Christian, the sufficiency for every believer, the sufficiency for every need. We're coming to this message on a three perspectives. Number one, the sufficiency of his tribes for healing and health. The sufficiency of his tribes for our healing and health. Number two, the sufficiency of his sacrifice for holiness of heart. The sufficiency of his sacrifice for our holiness of heart. Number three, the sufficiency of his suffering for our securing habitation in heaven. That's the goal. That's the destiny. That's the destination. That's the final thing. Where you live in eternity. Where you'll stay in eternity. And you want a habitation in heaven forever. You want to secure that place. And the only way you can do that is because Christ has come to this world. And has borne your penalty, your punishment to secure a habitation for you in heaven. The sufficiency of his suffering for our securing habitation in heaven. Number one, the sufficiency of his tribes for our healing and health. Whatever the health condition, whatever the health challenge, his tribes are sufficient to heal you and to keep you healthy. And keep you sound all the days of your life. Somebody said amen over there. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53. I'm reading from verse 3. It's talking about Christ in prophetic perspective. It's talking about Christ before Christ ever came into this world. And it comes to tell us what Christ will do you. How Christ will be received. How Christ will be rejected. How Christ will die. How Christ will pay the price for everything you need from heaven. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not surely. Surely, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Because of our transgression, because of our sins, the sins of the whole world. And yours in particular, it says he was wounded. Hands wounded, feet wounded, head wounded, 
and then a spear that pierced him. He was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of a peace was upon him. Tell me the rest over here. I said, tell me with the preacher's voice and with his tribes, we are healed. And those tribes are sufficient for our healing. And then he goes on to say, in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to its own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You come to the side of God. You come into agreement with God. And God has laid all your iniquity upon him. You say, yes, Lord, I agree with that. Yes, Lord, I believe that. Yes, Lord, I accept that. And salvation will be yours immediately in Jesus' name. In verse 7, it was oppressed. It was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. What an example for us. What an example for you. After you come into the kingdom and you're oppressed and you're afflicted and you're denied your right, you don't open your mouth to any man. You go to pray and the Lord will answer your prayer. Oppression will be taken away. Those afflictions will be taken away. And those persecutions you'll overcome in Jesus' name. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb so he opened not his mouth as the word of god assures us there in prophetic language looking forward to the coming of the lord jesus christ what he will do he says by his tribes we're healed. He carried our sorrows. He carried our grief. He carried our shame. He carried our sickness. Carried everything away. Look at the fulfillment in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Reading from verse 16. It tells us, And when the evening was come, Like this evening. I said like this evening. When the evening was come, They brought unto him many that were possessed of devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed how many of them he healed how many of us he healed all that was sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself this talking about healing of the body himself himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. He has carried your sicknesses away. You'll not carry that anymore. He's carried the bodies away. You'll not carry that anymore. He's carried the oppression away. You'll not carry that anymore. He's carried the yokes away. You'll not carry that anymore. And he's carried all the curses away. And you're not going to carry that anymore. Thank God somebody there is free tonight. I said thank God somebody there is free tonight. Because Jesus Christ bore the stripes. And it says, by his tribes you are healed. Look at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 24. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's what Calvary has done. It says himself, his own self, Jesus Christ. His own self, the master of all circumstances. His own self, the expected Messiah. His own self, our substitute. His own self, our savior. His own self, our redeemer. Who is his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. And he says, by whose stripes? Tell me, by whose stripes, shout it out and make it personal now. By whose stripes, you're healed in Jesus' name. As you believe that, notice my word. I didn't say if you believe that because I'm talking to believers tonight. I said I'm talking to believers tonight. Any believer on that side? What are they here? I said, where are they over there? 
You're a believer tonight. I didn't say, if you believe that, I'm saying, since you believe that. Because you believe that. And because you are believing this, by his stripes, you're healed in Jesus' name. Every promise of healing that the Lord Almighty, God Almighty had given in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, everything became culminated, came to a climax as you come to Calvary. And everything God had said he will do, that he will heal your body and he will keep your body healthy. Now you look to Calvary and Calvary will solve every sickness, every problem of sickness in your life in Jesus' name. And so as you look at the promises of healing in the Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testament, you're going to find by stripes, all those promises are going to be fulfilled in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 26. It's, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandment and keep all the statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Look at that verse again. It says, This is the Almighty God talking. If thou will DJ hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do what is right in his sight. Hold on for a moment. You have not always done what was right in the sight of the Lord. But understand, that's why Jesus came. That's why he came to fulfill the law of God for you. And because he has fulfilled the law of God for you, as your substitute, God is looking at you now, and he has put the righteousness of Christ in you. And the condition you could not fulfill, thank God, Christ fulfilled that condition for you. I said that the condition God has fulfilled in Christ for you. And then he says that no conditions are fulfilled on your behalf. By the Lord Jesus Christ, by your substitute, by the one that bore your stripes, he says, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which are brought upon the Egyptians. Those diseases that kill the people of the world will get away from your life. He will heal you of them. He'll set you free from them. And then he says, I am the Lord that healeth you. He will keep you healthy in Jesus' name. On the one hand, there is healing. On the other hand, there is health. On the one hand, it takes away the sicknesses that are there. On the other hand, it keeps them away that they will not come back. I see a healthy congregation. I said, I see a healthy congregation. You will be healthy in Jesus' name. Your family will be healthy in Jesus' name. And you will not die the death of other people in Jesus' name. Look at some, look at some 103, some 103. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. All his benefits. Because it's a sufficiency. Is sufficient for every benefit, is sufficient for every request, is sufficient for every prayer request. It says in verse, verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? How many iniquities does he forgive? And then who healeth? How many of thy diseases? All thy diseases. Praise the Lord, it has happened already. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies thy mouth? There's sufficiency here tonight. I said there's sufficiency here tonight. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed as the eagles? He renew your life. He'll take away every sickness and every infirmity and every oppression that has bothered you even until this time in Jesus name. After healing you then he'll keep those sicknesses away. Psalm 107 verse 20. Psalm 107 verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That's what he has done. 
That's what he's doing. And now he's telling you, all you need to do is ask. Just like salvation is available, all you need to do is ask. Forgiveness available, all you need to do is ask. Healing available, all you need to do is ask. Victory available, all you need to do is ask. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Thank God tonight is your night. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. Behold, I will bring it health and kill. He has given us healing. Now he's talking about health. And he says, I'll bring it health and kill. And I will kill them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And now Christ came into this world. And you know the story. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And before he left, he gave us the use of his name. And he says, whatever we ask in that name will be granted. We have that name of Jesus. I say we have that name of Jesus. In that name there's salvation. In that name there's healing. In that name there's answer to prayer. In that name, in that name there's joy. In that name there's peace. In that name, there's the possession of all the promises of the Lord. And tonight is that night. He'll grant it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 verse 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name, somebody tell me, in the name in the name let satan hear in the name let the heavens hear in the name let that name penetrate every sickness around here in the name in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk and he took him by the hand by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately somebody shout immediately Immediately his feet and ankle bows received strength and leaping up stood. He leaping up stood and he walked and he entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him. We'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. I'll see that healing on you. That deliverance on you. That dominion on you. And it says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. And he knew that it was he. We sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. They were filled with wonder and amazement. But remember, it's by the stripes of Jesus Christ. And when people see you after this dawn of a new beginning, they will wonder at you. I said they will wonder at you. And it says in verse 11, as a lame man, which was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified the Son, Jesus. And he's still glorified. I said he's still glorified whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and, and killed the Prince of Life whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Look at verse 16 now and his name. Somebody say, and his name. 
and his name say that again and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong where is the man has made this man strong. Where is the woman there? Has made this woman strong. Whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him. Has given him this perfect soundness. In the presence of you all. The Lord will do it. I said the Lord will do it. it remains ever the same. Acts chapter 10. Verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing. How many people? I said, and healing. How many people here tonight? And healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Has he changed? Has the stripes lost the power? No, by the stripes of Jesus tonight, you are still healed. What does the Bible say? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The same yesterday. And today and forever. If you reject sickness, that sickness has to leave. If you say no to disease, that disease has to leave. And if you say, no, that's not mine, that's not mine. You see your body there, it's present there. But you say, no, it's strange. There's a foreign thing here. What's this thing finding here? And then you bring out the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, you say, go. What will happen? It will go in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Reading here from verse 1. In those days was it God seek unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That's where some people give up. They give up the ghost. They give up their faith. They give up the desire to live. They give up everything. Somebody has come, not an ordinary person. Isaiah came to him. The great mighty prophet came to him and said, set your house in order for thou shalt die and not live. Then in verse 2, he turned his face to the wall and he preached unto the Lord saying, I beseech thee O Lord, remember now how I have watched with thee in truth. And with a perfect heart. Hold on, hold on. You say, can I say that? Can I say that? Well, that's why Christ came. Maybe you couldn't say that. You have not walked with a perfect heart. But look at Jesus, your substitute. Look at Jesus, your sacrifice. And he is our sufficiency. Maybe you cannot talk like Ezekiel spoke. And he said, I've done everything perfectly. But Christ on your behalf has done everything perfectly. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiel wept so. And it came to pass. For before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. That the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, thus says the Lord, every negative prophecy is reversed tonight concerning your life. <laughs> thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Have you prayed since you came here? I have heard thy prayer. <laughs> have you prayed today? I said, have you prayed today? I have heard thy prayer prayer. Have you made any request before the Lord today concerning yourself, concerning your wife, concerning your husband, concerning your child, concerning the child? God says, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal you. 
What, what is your amen gone? Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days, you say it for yourself. And I will add unto thy days. And I will add unto thy days. Fifteen years. Many more years of service for you. Many more years of serving the Lord in Jesus' name. And Christ has done that. Christ has done that. Because his sacrifice is a sufficiency. The sufficiency of his stripes for our healing, for our health. Point number two. The sufficiency of his sacrifice for our holiness of heart. Everything the Lord demanded in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Christ came to fulfill that for you and for me. He demanded holiness, holiness of heart. And Christ came to provide that for you and for me. And that sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient. We don't need to add psychology. We don't need to add philosophy. We don't need to add human effort. Christ has done it. And as you come to Calvary, at the end you are under that cleansing blood and that transforming blood and that blood that washes whiter than snow. He will sanctify you and make you holy. Look at Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7. He says, sanctify yourselves. Therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. In verse 8, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. And Jesus Christ is the intermediary, is the avenue, and is the sacrifice by which the cleansing power and the recreating power of the Almighty God comes to you. And through that sacrifice, it makes you holy, it sanctifies you. That, that's the interpretation of uh, Leviticus as we come to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 10. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, here in verse 10, it says, By which, by the which we, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. That's the sacrifice, and it is a sacrifice that makes us Holy that sanctifies us. Look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, the final sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, that great sacrifice on Calvary, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by one offering, for by one sacrifice, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And it is through that sacrifice, it is through that final perfect sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice to God, that he purifies us. And that purification, that holiness, the purity, be yours in Jesus' name. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, telling us the importance of such holiness of heart, of such purity of heart, that Christ has purchased for us, and then you just go to him now, because he's made the sacrifice. And then you ask him, and he cannot say no. That's what he paid for. That's it. What was what he paid so that he can provide it for you? He tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You will see God. I said you will see God. But you see, to see God and to be in the presence of God, it requires that your heart will be pure. And you couldn't cleanse your heart by yourself. You couldn't purify your heart by yourself. You couldn't make holy, sanctify your heart by yourself. That's why Christ paid that sacrifice. That's why he made that sacrifice. So he can purge you, purify you, cleanse you, and remove every sin. Even the depravity, the original sin. So he can remove everything from you, we're told. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. 
Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It tells us, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, talking about Christ, and the express image of his person, talking about Christ, and uphold the inner all things by the word of his power. Look at this. When he had by himself, when he, Christ, had himself, by himself purged our sins. That's the purity. That's the holiness. That's the sanctification. He did it on the cross of Calvary. And he says, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. It's done. And now by faith, you can claim it. By faith, you can have it. By faith, you can possess it. Thank God, he'll purify your heart. He'll make your heart holy. And he'll make it so pure, no stain of the original sin will remain there in Jesus' name. Is anything too hard for God? Is anything impossible for God? He has saved you. Can he sanctify you? He has sanctified you. Can he fill you with the Holy Ghost? And he has done all that. Can he heal your body? With God, all things are possible. In my life, all things are possible. I said in my life, all things are possible. In my family, all things are possible. In our church, all things are possible. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 9. Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. We're reading from chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them. You know what that is saying? Here is Peter speaking. And Peter is saying, we apostles and they Gentiles. He has not put any difference between us. We Jews and they Gentiles. He has not put any difference between us. We who walked with the Lord and we saw Jesus Christ face to face. And these people in the house of Cornelius who had never seen the Lord face to face. He says he puts no difference between us. And put no difference between us and them. And he put no difference between us, the men and the women. He puts no difference between us, the parents and our children. And he put no difference between us and them. Purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Everyone that believes that Christ is the final substitute, sacrifice, and his final sanctifier tonight, he will do it in Jesus' name. And he tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And has given himself for us. Not just for them. Paul the apostle is talking to the Gentiles here. He has given himself for us. And he has given himself for us. And offering and a sacrifice to God. For his sweet smelling savor. What for? What's that to accomplish? Verse 25. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. That's the love we're ready about him, verse 2. That made him to give himself as an offering, as a sacrifice. And gave himself for the church. That he might sanctify. Thank God, the sanctification. I said, thank God, the sanctification. And it's for you. I said, it's for you. Where are you there? I said, it's for you. Say, it's for me. That ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That ye might present it to himself. A glorious church. What does that mean? A church of glorious members. A church of glorious workers. A church of glorious leaders. You will be glorious. A glorious Christian. A glorious convert. A glorious conqueror, a glorious member. That amen is going down. A glorious worker, a glorious preacher. That's what makes a glorious church. 
Because it's all of us together, the assembly of called out people. The assembly of people that are Christians and children of God. And we come together as a church, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Titus chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Who gave himself as a sacrifice and as a sufficiency, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In a first Thessalonians chapter 3, chapter 4, First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Let's read that together. Make it personal. For this is the will of God, even my sanctification. Let me hear you. For this is the will of God. Even my sanctification. I want to hear you. Heaven wants to hear you. Say it by yourself. One, two, three, go. You know, there are people, after they have heard about sanctification and holiness, purity of heart, and then maybe some temptations come. And they don't understand temptation is not sin. It's when you yield to that temptation, there is sin. And every temptation that comes your way, Christ lives on the inside of you. You will overcome in Jesus' name. And then they're saying, maybe, maybe, maybe this temptation is not for me. Thank God it's for you. I say, thank God it's for you. And anywhere you go, this sanctification will go with you. For this is the will of God, even my sanctification. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That's your calling, it will be fulfilled. That's your calling, heaven will see it in your heart. I will see it in your life in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 14, 1 Peter, chapter 1, reading from verse 14. As obedient children, thank God, that's the kind of child he wants you to be. And that's the kind of child you are. I said that's the kind of child you are. What kind of children are we? I said what kind of children are you? As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance. Those days of ignorance are over in Jesus' name. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. He has done it. It will be your possession. Yeah. Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 6. Knowing this. You need to know this experientially. You need to know this personally. You need to know this by contacting and connecting with Christ and Calvary. It's your sacrifice. It's your substitute. It's your sanctifier. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth we're more than conquerors. Henceforth we're overcomers. Henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead... We're dead with him. We're dead with him. He that is dead is freed from sin. Look at verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves 
to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, for sin, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey each in the loss thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Will not have dominion over you. Look at verse 16. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, if servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin or unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness, but God be sent. Heaven is thanking God on your behalf. Paul the apostle is thanking God on your behalf. We are all thanking God for you. You are not what you used to be. I said you are not what you used to be. Grace has come in your heart. That sacrifice has taken effect in your life. I thank God for you. I said I thank God for you. And heaven will keep on thanking God for you in Jesus' name. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, past tense, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And you keep on looking to Jesus. What the Lord has done will be permanent in your life in Jesus' name. When temptation comes, look to Jesus. When any pressure comes to yield, look to Jesus. When it appears the old life is rushing like a flood, I want to overwhelm you. Look to Jesus, and Jesus will help you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, for the joy that was set before him in the other cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. As you look to Jesus, what will he do? This is what he'll do. He'll help you to fulfill verse 14. Look at verse 14. Follow peace with a few men. Follow peace with all men. Some of them are nice. Some of them are too nice. Some of them are not very nice after all. Some of them are simple to live with. Some of them are hard. Some of them are, de they are desirous of living at peace with you. And some of them just make up their mind. They aren't going to be at peace with you. But on your part, you'll have abundant grace. You'll have sufficient grace. And you will be at peace with everyone in Jesus' name. You will not fight. I can't hear my people. You will not start a fight. And if anybody starts a fight, you'll quench it and bring peace in the land in Jesus' name. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. All that the Lord has provided. He has provided for you and is sufficient. And tonight 
And every time you call upon the Lord, you'll find his provision, you'll find his grace, you'll find everything he has provided at Calvary. You'll find it sufficient. It will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. Number one, the sufficiency of his stripes for our healing and health. Number two, the sufficiency of his sacrifice for our holiness of heart. Number three, the sufficiency of his suffering for our securing habitation in heaven. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 21. For even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Christ also suffered, make it personal. Christ also suffered. Christ also suffered for you, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't retaliate. When he was insulted, he insulted not back. When he was assaulted, he didn't assault them back. When he was reviled, he didn't revile again. All the Pharisees came and he wanted to do whatever negative thing. He was full of love. You are going to be full of love in Jesus' name. But when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, when he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his soon self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose tribes, by whose tribes, he were healed. He suffered. And he suffered for you. Chapter 3, verse 18. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. He didn't commit any sin. It's for the sin you committed. He suffered. And we're talking about his suffering. So that he can secure habitation for you in heaven. It says, for Christ also has once suffered for our sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, and quickened by the Spirit, he suffered, and he did that for you. First Peter chapter four, I'm reading from verse one. First Peter chapter four, verse one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh it tells us over and over christ has suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves equip yourself gird yourself close yourself honest yourself and yourselves likewise with the same mind for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, has taught sinning, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the loss of men, but to the will of God. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the reason why Christ suffered for us to give you a place in heaven, habitation in heaven. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look at this. To an inheritance, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Reserved in heaven for you. Are you going there? I said, are you going there? When you get there, you'll find the Lord has been waiting for you. 
and he has reserved, he has reserved an inheritance that will not fade away. He has reserved it for you in Jesus' name. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And actually, what it does is it starts by writing your name in the register in the book of life in heaven. And then thereafter, it stays by you, it stands by you, protecting you, preserving you, and giving you every encouragement you need, and giving you every grace you need, and making everything sufficient for you so that as your name is there, you'll also go there eventually. And you will answer when your name is called. And when your name is called over there, you'll be there to answer in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 20. Luke chapter 10 verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. But rather rejoice because your names are reaching in heaven. And you know, there are some people, they have not read all through their Bibles, and they say that those who were alive when Jesus was alive, before he went to die on the cross of Calvary, they said that, you know, none of them was born again. And they said that Sunday day of Pentecost, Pentecost came and they were born again. Look at this. He's talking to the 17. He was still on earth with them. And he says, rejoice not because the spirits are subject unto you. But rejoice, rejoice. Rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That heaven, thank God you'll be there. I said, thank God you'll be there. That's why Jesus has gone and you are going to follow. I said that's why Je where Jesus has gone and you are going to follow. Where is Jesus now? I said where is Jesus now? Look at Luke chapter 24 verse 51. Luke chapter 24 verse 51. And it came to pass while he blessed them he was departed from them and carried up into heaven. Carried up into heaven. Acts of the Apostles records that too. Acts chapter 1. Reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. And when he had, thus, when he had spoken these things. While they beheld. He was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? They same Jesus, our Savior. They same Jesus, our substitute. They same Jesus, our sacrifice. They same Jesus, our sanctifier. They same Jesus, our shepherd, which is taken up from you into heaven into heaven shall so come in like manner as he have seen him go into heaven and it says where he is there you are going to be i said there you are going to be i can't hear your amen you'll be there in jesus name john chapter 17 john chapter 17 verse 21 that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given unto them, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perf made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Listen to verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Where is he? I said where is he? Where are you going to be? Who will you be with there? Oh, Jesus. It says that they that you have given me 
may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. That's our desire. That's our goal. That's the reason we're serving the Lord. That's the reason we're saved. That's the reason we keep saved. That's the reason we persevere. Because he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Hebrews chapter 11. Reading from verse 14. Hebrews 11 verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country. That is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. I'm going there. I said I'm going there. We'll be there together in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That's why he suffered to take us to heaven. That's why he suffered. To pay the penalty for our sin. That's why I suffered. To take away the depravity, the original sin. That's why I suffered. So that it can purify us. Make us holy. Make us pure. Ready for heaven. It says, Jesus Christ. Jesus also. That he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore. Unto him without the calm, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. What you seek, you are going to find. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be closed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be, that being closed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do grow. Being bodied, not for that we will be unclosed, but closed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that has wrought us, for the same, for the same, same sin is God, who also has given us, has given unto us the earnest of his spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Know what that is saying? Here now we are in the body. Here now we are on earth. And we are not, we are absent from the Lord in heaven. It says in verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we're confident I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and present of the Lord. When we're absent from the body, that is when we live here, we're going to the great beyond. We're going to heaven. Thank God we're going to be there. Enoch is there, you'll be there. Elijah is there, you'll be there. Moses is there, you'll be there. Above all, Jesus is there, and you'll be there in Jesus' name. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. It tells us, for me to live, 
for me to for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet I know yet what I shall choose, I know not I what not. For I am in a stretch between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. It's going to happen one of these days. I said it will happen one of these days. That heaven, praise the Lord, you are saved, you are sanctified, you are made holy, you are made righteous. You'll find his grace sufficient, he'll take you there. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. The rapture may take place any time from now. And thank God, when the trumpet sounds, who is going to hear the trumpet? Who is going to be there? You are going to be there. Because he says in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, shall not precede, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from where? From heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and, the, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, you'll be part of this one. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The time is about ready. That the Lord himself will come from heaven. And then he will take you to heaven. Remember, you must be saved. Remember, you must be sanctified. Remember, you must be kept holy. There's no chance for you know up, down, out, in, holy today, or righteous tomorrow. But thank God, grace is available every time. And grace is available even now. And it will give you sufficient, abundant grace in Jesus' name. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And tell me, and I say, tell me, we shall be changed. You'll be changed. You'll get out of this world. Are you going to get to that heaven in Jesus' name? I'll be there. Where are you? I said, I'll be there. Where are you? I said, I'll be there. Where are you? You'll be there in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, He has abundant grace available for you. He has sufficient grace available for you. He tells us His sacrifice is sufficient. His sacrifice is abundant. He's able to do it. This is your time. This is your time. It's the dawn of a new beginning. New grace and new strength and new power and new vision. New desire, new decision. 
Tell the Lord, he will do it in your life. He'll do it in your life. He can give you health and healing, healing and health. He can give you holiness of heart. He'll give you habitation in heaven as well. Call upon the Lord and the Lord will confirm it in your life.